How is a little lunch? A little protein, a little something? Hello, Daryl Reginelli. Hope you enjoyed that with a little side of legs by our dear friend Bella Blue and her incredible band. But before we kick this off, quickly, a big thank you to Harry, a technology platform that helps hospitality brands manage their teams. Matt Ertling and Steve Sickinger with Hamco. They've been wonderful to us, a local New Orleans custom printer, and our friends at Jasmine Rice and Tulane Freeman School of Business. I do not know what I would do without Iris Solomon and John Clark at Tulane, our partners also at Noki. They have started a hospitality entrepreneurship program they will be teaching at Noki. This is thrilling, you all. So did you all know that this year is the tricentennial of New Orleans? I think you all did know that. We've been eating and drinking and carrying on for 300 years in our city. And as we were thinking about today, it was important for me and our team to make sure our incredible local chefs took, took to the stage. It is my pleasure to introduce our chef, Tori McPhail from Commander's Palace, and our just opened picnic provisions and whiskey to lead us into a discussion on all things cuisine. 300 years and we're just getting started. Tori McPhail is an extraordinary chef, friend, and partner. His intensity, work ethic, and talent inspire me daily. We have worked together for 22 years, and I look forward to seeing him every day. We can finish each other's sentences, and we're still having a ball. Tori, if we just get through today, I promise I won't put any Barbara Streisand on the jukebox at picnic. getting started. To understand the future, we must study the past or be doomed to repeat it. It can also be said that the future is buried in the past. In 1983, chefs Paul Perdome and Larry Forgione stood before a crowd and spoke about the idea that American food should be about our America and should be creative and express regional environments and seasonality. Great chefs also like Jeremiah Tower were saying the same thing and cooking with local vegetables and sustainable seafood instead of importing product from Europe and faraway places. Farm to table is all well and good, but needs to be framed with purpose and place. As an example, let's talk about Greg Sanamo, a local farmer. He's got a farm called Tomat's Cajun Farm. He sells us the very first tomatoes, then the ripe tomatoes, but also sells us the heavy, wet, spotted, inconsistent, and ugly tomatoes at the, at the end of the year at a more valued price. This whole crop cookery is where we need to move to to take our sustainability to the next level. Some towns practice farm to table as a collection of simple ingredients on a plate, yet other towns practice farm to table to trace that community's cultural significance. Every dish needs to tell a story. It needs to be smart and meaningful, and every sub recipe in a dish has a very specific role to play in that experience. As an example, Chef Paul Perdome's Redfish Cubillon, a classic dish that showcases the regional cooking of South Louisiana during the warm summer months when fresh tomatoes and seafood are at their peak. Seasonal cooking with big, fresh flavors and familiarity that's easily recognized by multiple generations. Another example, my mentor, Chef Jamie Shannon's dish, Shrimp and Tasso, similar in having great local Louisiana flavors, yet presented in a more modern and artistic way to please a newer generation of eager diners. Again, big flavors, bright colors, hot and cold temperatures, multiple textures, and has a stunning and complex range of craveable flavors. When we look at farm to table, it's not one size fits all. How I cook in New Orleans should be different than how my brother cooks back in Washington State where we grew up. So we should ask ourselves, who are we, where have we come from, where are we going, and what town do I cook in? As we move forward, we need to ask ourselves, what should we be cooking in my town? So future trends. It would be irresponsible for any of us to talk about what spices will be popular, the level of seasoning, or the most exciting new culinary techniques without first considering the cold hard facts of what's about to happen in this fragile world we've grown up in. Regardless of your opinion or position on why global change is happening, it's happening. And we better wake up and look at this freight train coming down the tracks right at us. 
population boom, 30% human population boom in the next 30 years worldwide. 30%. That's, uh, that's pretty significant. But for us, gang, it is all about the people. It's about people. It's about people. That is our future trend. So things to consider. Climate change. Our bee population is declining when it needs to be increasing and quick. From April 2015 to April 2016, America has experienced an unexplained 44% mortality rate in bees coast to coast. Let's talk about new alternatives to current agricultural techniques, examples like vertical farming. There are several examples of urban farming near large cities that are producing high quality, sustainable vegetables by using energy efficient solar power, misting techniques, and focused light for rapid photosynthesis. This also re-energizes inner city populations by teaching people a new skill set that wouldn't previously be possible in their communities until right now. This one might be a little odd, but what's your opinion on lab-grown meat? stem cell research and they cultivate that in the laboratory so the whole thing comes out looking like a burger. 50% of our fresh water supply goes to the cultivation of livestock, either the animals themselves or the feed that sustains them, 50%. GMO versus non-GMO. Everyone in this new world needs to eat. The farmers need to have higher yields, increasing volumes, regardless of what nature has in store. How many of our nieces or nephews Sons or daughters are currently enrolling in agricultural universities this fall to make a positive environmental impact when it matters the most. 30%? Maybe not. I doubt it. So does that mean that the future of American food will be heavily reliant on massive corporations that focus on shareholder profitability versus healthy nutrition and environmental sustainability? Let's consider farming in the oceans. The idea of the underwater farming plants and animals in our world's ocean is very real. We've just hit a positive tipping point recently. We now eat more farm-raised fish worldwide than wild-caught fish thanks to modern advancements in aquaculture. As an example here, let's talk about our friend Cliff Hall and our buddies from the New Orleans Fish House and their redfish farm in Palacio, Texas. <coughs> they produce more redfish than any other redfish farm on the Gulf Coast to provide a sustainable signature item that has become synonymous with locals and visitors alike when describing the top recipes that define South Louisiana. We also need to consider ocean-based vegetables. Imagine large tracts of underwater lettuce, kelp, and seaweed. No need for irrigation or fertilization. They use the sun's natural rays to photosynthesize and absorb all the ocean's rich, rich nutrients to flourish. Insects, I know we kind of talked about it earlier. I'm not a huge fan of insects. I'm really not. However, the last time I was in Houston, I sat down at Hugo's and they had some uh, spicy ants on the menu. I had to have them. I'm I'm not racing out to get them, but I'll tell you what, two billion people regularly consume insects for added protein in the diet, eaten freshly cooked, dried, or crunched on for a snack, or pulverized into flour for baking. And how different is it than crawfish? I mean, we eat the heck out of uh, 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 boiled crawfish around here, right? Uh, And I can imagine some of the great creative chefs up here, they might be able to do crawfish boiled grasshoppers and probably pull it off with a couple ice cold ones at the end of the day. Um, Let's talk about EHOs, edible, all natural water bottles. So purified water that's been frozen into a ball and then coated in an organic material, a fully biodegradable water bubble that will break down completely in a matter of months to replace any need for plastic bottles from here on out worldwide. An obvious trace back to modern molecular gastronomy. Heard of Soylent, a plant-based non-dairy meal replacement that's full of soy protein and all the daily vitamins and nutrition to sustain the human body. I I cannot imagine that would be better than a juicy double quarter pounder from Portocol uh, or really good crawfish boil fried chicken, but that is what's on the horizon. Finally, there's algae, marketed under several names, but you may recognize the name spirulina. It's the fastest growing plant on earth and can be cultivated in ocean or fresh water and has 20 times more sustainability than land-based cultivated crops. As far as other predictions and trends, I think the popularity of New Orleans cuisine is the longest running food trend in American history. No matter where you're cooking in this great country, big, bold, intense flavors never fade or fall out of fashion. So our call to action, we need to open our minds. We really, really need to open our minds and consider the possibilities of where American food is going. 
as, as us chefs, we may have an opportunity for a national platform to practice our creative craft. However, we have a responsibility to our community to be advocates for our environment. So future generations may be blessed with as much amazing food that defines our future of American food. I'm excited to introduce the moderator for our next panel, celebrating our city's incredible culinary history and future. There is no one more well-suited to lead this discussion than Brett Anderson, our respected restaurant critic at the Times Speakeryune. We've already had the pleasure of hearing from Brett this morning during the rapid fire Q&A session. So without further ado, let's welcome our friend, two times James Beard, award-winning writer and former Harvard Neiman Fellow, Brett Anderson. Thank you, Tori, and everyone else. Um, you know what, there's something about Ella Brennan that, um, I've, I moved here in 2000, uh, so I've been here for 18 years, and something that I sort of immediately saw when I saw her, and I feel like I'm not alone in this, but she reminded me of sort of anyone in my life that I had ever known up to that point that got a lot of shit done. And, <laughs> you know, and I think that that was something that really sort of endeared her to people. And she really pushed herself and by extension the folks around her to, to reach for an excellence that didn't look that easy to grasp. And when she did that, and I think one of the reasons we're all here today, is she did it to the benefit of herself and her family and her colleagues, but also the city at large. And you know, she was obviously a leader in the restaurant industry, but she was also a leader in the city. And I know that that's true of a lot of restaurateurs in other places. There are folks in this room who are evidence of that. But it's frankly more true in New Orleans because of the position the culinary arts holds in our cultural and economic life. Um, we are a diverse population, but we are not a terribly diverse economy. And as a consequence, the leaders in the restaurant industry are leaders in our civic life, whether they like it or not. <laughs> um, and today, um, well, Ella understood this, I would say, before she was in a position to sort of be that person, which is something I hope young restaurateurs and restaurant professionals take to heart. Um, but today on the stage, we have people who, chef restaurateurs, writer commentators, who I feel really have sort of followed in the footsteps of Ella um, in this regard, and are leaders in the next generation in this particular industry. Um, we're going to hear from each of them about how New Orleans has played a role as sort of a muse in their life, which in a lot of instances um, involves perceptions of what its, its food's history is, what its present is, what its future is, and taking a cue from Tori, uh, we're going to ask everyone to also take a shot at, at, at telling us what they think the city's future might hold in terms of a restaurant and food community and sort of what their future might hold in that environment. Um, and I'm going to start by introducing Nina Compton. Um, Nina is the chef and co-owner of Compare La Pan and Bywater American Bistro. Um, uh, one of the many things about Nina that's interesting, but I think particularly in the context of this group, is she's the most recent arrival. Um, she opened Capera La Pan in 2015, correct? Mm -hmm. Which is like, you know, yesterday. And, um, and came here from Miami. She's originally from St. Lucia. Uh, did I say that right? St. Lucia. St. Lucia, I know I always <laughs> say it wrong. Um, and, and she's gonna talk to us a little bit about an experience that any new arrival has had, although I think she's had a real intense <laughs> version yeah. of this, of being sort of the new person in town, and how do you fit in? So when I, I got a phone call to open my restaurant in New Orleans, I never thought it would happen, because I always wanted to live here, and I always tried to figure out how can I move there and really enjoy life. And when I came here, I was nervous, because you talk about all these culinary heavyweights, now my friends. And when I moved here, I didn't know anybody. I knew of people, but I didn't know anybody. And when people started reading about us opening the restaurants, people would stop me at the store and say, thank you for moving here. And I'm like, this is, this is a little odd. And then as we were getting closer to opening the restaurants, people were sending us cards and flowers saying, thank you for opening a restaurant here. And I don't think there's any city in this world that could do that. I can welcome people as an outsider coming in, especially as a chef, because you talk about years of tradition here, and I'm opening a different style of restaurant that is kind of similar in, I, I would say, in background, but it was petrifying, because you have places like Commander's Palace, you have Emerald, you have Donna Link, you have Leah Chase, who's been around for decades, 
And here I am coming in, opening this restaurant, and people were welcoming me with opening arms. And I remember Donald actually invited me for lunch. Um, he sent me an email, he's like, oh, I want to have lunch with you. And I'm like, oh my God, he's gonna sit me down and he's gonna tell me why am I opening a restaurant here? And it was quite the opposite because he was sitting down and he was just trying to find out my background. And I think that's something special about the city because people are so genuine and so warm and they want to support you. And when I met Leah Chase, um, she said to me, she's like, you have to make it here. And she's like, we are, we are behind you. And that's something that's very special and I think very unique about the city because they are just, they've gone through so much hardship with Katrina, but you hear everybody's stories and all my chef friends talk about, we had to come back and rebuild the city because we had to take care of our people. So I think that's very special for me coming into the city for the first time. Um, next to Nia, thank you. Actually, Nina, we have another minute or two okay. for you. Can you talk a little bit about, you, you've just opened a new restaurant, yes. and, and perhaps it's uh, an exhausting thing to think <laughs> about what, uh, what sort of the future holds for you, but, uh, but I'm going to ask anyway. Um, you know, when you see things uh, in, your, in your professional life, two, three, down, three, three, four, five, ten years down the road, what do you see? I think that the beauty of New Orleans is that people really love food, and they love just eating out. There's a common joke that people talk about when they go to lunch, they say, oh, where are we having dinner tonight? It's always on their radar, so that's something as a chef, it's a beautiful thing because people are just excited uh, to eat out. And when you, I think New Orleans is in a beautiful place right now where we are able to, like I said, you know, coming into this very traditional setting where people are actually branching out from the traditional stuff where people are saying, I want to try hummus. I want to try you know, your curried goat for the first time. I was scared to put curry goat on the menu because I'm like, people are not going to eat goat. We go through so much goat, it's, 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 it's crazy. It's insane. We went from buying one goat to now we buy like seven goats a week because we just can't keep up. But people here are just so open-minded and they just love to eat food because as long as you're approachable and you're comforting and you just hit the spot for people here, they really embrace you and they, they're behind you. So I think it's a beautiful platform where people are actually opening up their horizons to new cuisines here, which is great. That is a, could be more perfect transition <laughs> um, to Michael Galata, who is a, uh, a native New Orleanian, a 1998 graduate of Brother Martin. Um, and uh, yeah, <laughs> I figured there was a little crowd here. Um, who worked in a number of uh, notable restaurants in New Orleans earlier in his career, including Marisol uh, Man Restaurant August. And uh, he is today the chef and uh, owner of Mofa and uh, Maypop restaurants, both of which, to what uh, the points that sort of Nina just touched on, very much complicate um, some of the historic uh, or, or the received wisdom about what the history of New Orleans cuisine is. Um, and I'll just let him talk about that <laughs> the, um, without spoiling it. Um, please. Okay. Well, um, yeah, I like complicating things, I guess. Uh, I get that a lot. And you uh, also talk about how it's not that complicated. It's not, yeah. I uh, also have to correct you, it is mofo, definitely, because, sorry, sorry. well, there's a purpose for that, and I'll get to it. Um, but it's definitely mofo. Uh, so I think when I thought about being on this panel, what I found was interesting is, and, and something that Lois and I talked about a lot last night, and so I'm gonna try not to steal too much of his thunder on it, but there was a big shift. Like, I, growing up in New Orleans, your neighborhood is your thing. So, like, you grow up differently from people in other neighborhoods, even though you are a New Orleanian. Uh, like, I, for me growing up, it, we boiled crab and shrimp. We never boiled crawfish when I was a kid. And, uh, and the same thing, like, when I was a kid, I never heard anyone talk about Super Sunday, and I, you know, we went and saw the Mardi Gras Inns during Mardi Gras, but you know, Super Sunday and Second Lines were, were part of a different neighborhood. And so these were different things, and then I found after the storm, everyone who started moving here, I remember like one of the most amazing things, I know it always comes back to the storm, but it was a big turning point for New Orleans, and it really changed things. And I remember, uh, you know, I was actually studying abroad, and I, you know, I rushed home and started working in a restaurant, and I remember people coming in the restaurants and being like, we're just here to support New Orleans, and that was the beginning of it, but what ended up happening 
was all these things that I didn't know about New Orleans, I started learning about. Because people coming in from out of town wanted to study New Orleans, they wanted to know about New Orleans. And so like now, even when I was a line cook before the storm, you know, cooks, we never talked about things like Super Sunday, and that one sticks in my mind because now my cooks talk about it when it's coming up. They're like, oh man, are you gonna be there? Are you gonna go? And I'm like, I never grew up going to that. And I'm from here, you know, and the same with like crawfish. Crawfish is like a phenomenon now. When crawfish season comes, people, it's like the most amazing thing on like NOLA Eats and all these things are all talking about where to get the best crawfish. When I was growing up, you went to a bar, when I was in high school, you went to a bar and got a beer and you got a token to go get some crawfish and then like that was the crawfish thing. Whereas now it's like this huge thing. And so I, I guess we had, a, we had a very separated history and I think now that history, even though it was a history, and what I love about New Orleans is that New Orleans, takes in and keeps the best of every culture that arrives at its door. And what's so amazing about that is like, we, yes, we have a French Quarter, but you know, a true French person hasn't lived there in forever. You know, like everyone lives there. <laughs> you know, we don't have a little Italy. We, you know, you know, the Italians all settled on the backside, like where my great grandparents grew up on the corner of Rampart and Esplanade. That's, you know, that's where all the Italians were being green, green grocers and popping up in Gentilly, you know, and, and but they all assimilated. Everyone assimilates in New Orleans. Everyone becomes a New Orleanian, um, which I love about like Nina. She's a New Orleanian now. And there's no there's no way around that because once you're in and once you're here and once you you show that you want to be a part of our city, then you're in. That's it. And and we're gonna we're gonna show you around and we're gonna cook you food and we're gonna and we're gonna take you in and make you uh, one of us. And and so I guess the interesting part is that's sort of what led into um, Mofo. And the reason we called it MoFo is because I'm a white guy, and but it's one of those hard decisions that we had. So like my, my two business partners and I all came up in New Orleans. We're all from New Orleans. We all grew up here, and we wanted to open a restaurant that was for bartenders, servers, and cooks. We wanted that restaurant where the people, those people could go on their day off. We wanted basically a hangover restaurant. Um, I know we're trying to fix that in our industry, but at the time, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's what. That was all about, uh, and, it, and it still works on Monday morning or Sunday morning, the, the, or not even, I'm sorry, Sunday morning for service industry people, around 2 p.m., there's all these zombies that shuffle into MoFo, and they're very grumpy until they get their first frozen boba tea uh, cocktail and their first bowl of pho, and then suddenly they're friendly as all get out. Um, and it still happens to this day, but me and, and, well, we sat there and we looked at this, this um, you know, we wanted to do our own thing. We wanted to do it on our own. We, we wanted to raise our own money. We wanted to open our own restaurant. We wanted to own it from top to bottom. We found a little spot in a strip mall. And we said, what are we gonna open in the strip mall? And what's gonna be an industry restaurant? And we we're like, man, what do we eat in our day off? We eat pho, we eat Vietnamese, because that's the one indigenous cuisine that's come in so late. And I mean, the Hondurans have followed that, but the, 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 the Vietnamese have been here just the right amount of time where they had really built a community and really built all these wonderful restaurants and that's where we would go because all we grew up eating was Creole French and that's all we knew and so we wanted a break from that. I mean, that's what we were cooking every day in the restaurants. And so we wanted a break from that. And it's hard to think that that was five years ago now, that MoFo was gonna be five years old. And when we opened it, it was like, people were like, what is wrong with you? What are you doing? That is the worst idea I've ever heard. You just came from a classical French restaurant. You're out of your mind. And we we're like, you know, we, but this is what we wanna do. Uh, and we had to call it MoFo because we had, and when we named it that, we sat down and we were like, all right, we're gonna call it <laughs> MoFo. And we're doing that because we, we almost can't take ourselves seriously on that side of it. But where we can take ourselves seriously, like we can't let people think that we're trying to be authentic because we're not. But it doesn't mean it can't have soul. And so where we can make it great is to make sure that we do bring all of our lessons from what is good service even, you know, even if there are no white tablecloths and we can still find really good silverware and really good glassware and we can still bring in really great alcohols and, and make really great classic or riffs on classic cocktails that are built quickly and to your table fast and well balanced and delicious. Uh, same with a small by the glass wine list where everything's curated and perfect so you can enjoy those glasses of wine with our food and then each dish you know, we, we, we get the, the, the products, we, we, we treat it with all the love and care. If there's gonna be a curry, we make it in a mortar and pestle. Uh, we grind it by hand. You know, we, it, those things can still be done right, and that still keeps in the history that we grew up knowing in New Orleans, as New Orleans cuisine. You know, I was lucky enough, I was raised by a single mom, but we always had a home-cooked meal. Except on, there was one day of the week where we had to go to Shoney's because she was tired. <laughs> and every other, but every other time, we had a home-cooked meal, and that's an amazing thing for a single mom who is a school teacher to do for us. 
And I think that resonated with, with, with my brother and I, who's my business partner, I think that resonated with us to service. You know, that's, that's what really shows someone love. And that's like, you know, Nina came in and, and made the food from her heart, and so everyone accepted her for that. And that's, that's the, the, the important part. And so I guess moving into the future, because I'm sure I'm getting to my five minutes here. Um, you are. <laughs> moving into the future. <laughs> I saw that. I saw that. Here, speed it up. Um, <laughs> I think Mo, Mofo and now Maypop is is the perfect idea of that. We, I, we, when we first opened, I called it you know uh, a hyper evolved. So like, what does a third generation Vietnamese person cook for their new spouse who is from Acadiana? Like, what do they cook for them to make them feel at home, but it's still rooted in their in in, in their history as well? And so I think that's what New Orleans it's New Orleans con is continuing to do what it's always done, which is take in everyone who arrives at its port and keep the best parts of them as they all become New Orleanians. And you... We're moving on to our next um, our panelist, Lois Eli, who is a, uh, was a longtime columnist at the Times, picking you and a colleague of mine, um, and is also an author of books and documentary films, currently a native New Orleanian, currently on loan to Los Angeles, where he works in television. I had to, the, you, he's currently working on a show called The Man in the High Castle, um, but uh, relevant to us here today is someone who's very much a student of the food of his native city, and in particular about, you know, both Nina and Michael have talked about um, sort of opening up the what we see when we see New Orleans food. Um, Lola has done a lot of work that's been very influential to me and others about looking back and seeing where weren't we kind of given the credit where it ought to have been given. Um, and I wonder if you might talk a little bit about your work in that regard. Indeed. Uh, one of my favorite stories about Louisiana cuisine appeared in one of Justin Wilson's book, where he talks about the revolution of the pots and pans, where some women of the French colony at that point came to the governor and complained that there was nothing to cook in this strange colony. And Madame Langlois, who was the governor's cook, came out and showed them that there were things to be made with the bounty of what was in Louisiana. And in that book, they referred to her as the first great cook or the first great chef in Louisiana. And then they say, and where did she learn how to manipulate these ingredients into these wonderful dishes? She learned it from the Indians, they say, <coughs> in this book, where they credit her with being the first great chef in Louisiana. Much of my work has been an attempt to expand our conception of who we are and where our food comes from. And the assumption, whenever you talk to people about anything, whether it's food or not food related, about New Orleans and about Louisiana, the idea is that the French did all of this for us, and therefore, that is why New Orleans is different, and that is why New Orleans is special. And indeed, the French play a very important role, particularly in terms of the establishment of restaurants and restaurant culture here. But the truth is, one of the things that makes New Orleans restaurants so distinct is the dialogue between the professional kitchen and the home kitchen. You go to many, if not most, of the fancy restaurants in New Orleans, and you will see jambalayas and gumbos and etouffees on the menu at these ostensibly fancy places. I don't think you see that in the same way in other cities around this country. So this notion that somehow the people of the city have something to contribute even to these professionally trained chefs becomes a defining feature of our city. The other thing you find is that our food gets defined and redefined by the subsequent groups of people who come here. Think of the moment about Saffron Nola, an ostensibly Indian restaurant in New Orleans with a damn good gumbo on the menu. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't have no gumbo when I was in Bombay. <laughs> um, so if we are to talk about our food and where it is going, I think we need to, to play with the notion of what the word Creole means. And in many ways, this definition is evolving and changing around us, whether we are conscious of it or not. And in the context of New Orleans, we see that kind of thing happening with Nina, of course, bringing in a new version of Creole fresh from the Caribbean. But let us not forget that even in the context of French food, the most recent large group of Francophone exiles to come to New Orleans were coming from Haiti. And we never, ever talk about Haitian influence on our food. I never had no red beans and rice in Paris. I had a lot of red <laughs> beans and rice in Haiti in port au -Prince. Often in the older cookbooks, you'll see him talking about the influence of the Spanish on our food. 
But as Jessica Harris taught me, in the context of 1800 New Orleans, that's a misnomer because Spain included those Spanish colonies in this area. Those people who were coming to this city because New Orleans was a great port city. And I'd remind us in attempting to move forward in our definition of Creole that these people are now coming back to us, particularly the Hondurans and the Central Americans, many of whom came here to help us in the rebuilding, and many of whom have remained among us. And I think about the extent to which these kinds of trends, this kind of taking from the current population to reimagine our food is already taking place. Um, on the NOLA menu, Emerald had Ms. Hayes stuffed chicken wings that was influenced by a Vietnamese person who was working there. Or Donald Link had uh, his uncle's black-eyed pea gumbo on the menu at Cochon. And I would suggest then that in attempting to figure out where we should go, we take a closer look at where we've come from. So often we speak in generic terms, particularly about the African influence on our food, and we never evaluate it further. But in fact, if you go specifically to Senegal, you go specifically to Benin, you go specifically to Ghana and these other countries in West Africa, from which we came, we find antecedents to our food that are often far, far more Creole than French. That tells us something about who we are. I think if we broaden our definition of Creole, and in fact, broaden our definition of ourselves, that will be the roadmap to the future of this cuisine. Um, as it happens, <laughs> uh, Donald Link, who, I, you know, I, I'll introduce Donald. <laughs> the, I, I say it like that because I don't think he really needs an introduction. Um, but uh, I, his, his restaurant group here, which includes Herb St. Cochon and Pesh, among others, I believe he's won more James Beard Awards than he has restaurants, at least at that group. <laughs> the, um, the, you know, you, you've really taken on a, a personal mission, it would seem to me, to try to deepen your understanding of New Orleans cooking, particularly as sort of a southern-facing Caribbean type of cuisine. Can you talk a little bit about that? <clears throat> yeah, it's nice to hear Lois talk about this, because I've been, I've been studying it a lot from my own personal knowledge, and, and John T. Edgenbert asked me recently why I'm doing it. And it's a good question because I think, you know, the answer is I really want to understand it more, and I think that as a chef over the last 20 years in New Orleans, I've, I've been asked a million times, what's the difference between Cajun and Creole, to the point where it's just become a really irritating question, to be honest. I mean, <laughs> so, and, then, and it's almost the thing started out as a, in an attempt to come up with the elevator speech on what the difference is. And it's not that easy. Uh, it's like Lola said, you know, in 1800-ish, let's just, I won't quote dates, but, you know, New Orleans had, what, 4,000 people, and with the Haitian refugees went to 8,000? I mean, that's a huge influence. Uh, there are French people that still come here today. Like, I got a, a guy I met at an event in Dijon. He brought his family down last year and said, I thought there would be French-speaking people here. And they, they, you hear it all the time. You have French people come here, and they're, like, kind of shocked that nobody speaks French. It's like they feel like they're going to, like when you go to Guadeloupe, for example, they speak French there, and like pretty much only French. Uh, but it's not like that. It's a misnomer that, that, that the French had this influence, but I mean, yes, they were here first in the 1600s, but they weren't cooking like they were cooking now. In the 1600s, they were fur trappers, and they were eating, you know, meal and beaver and turtle. Um, you, you know, what you have is the the African influence through the Caribbean from Puerto Rico to Cuba, all these islands, whether they were owned by England, France, or Spain, you know, the predominating element in all of these were the native, what is it, Taino, I think, in some of those islands, and then you've got, you know, the slaves from Africa, and you're right, and you would think of gumbo, that is the stew from West Africa, and then over its course, it changes over time depending on where it is. You gotta think Puerto Rico is settled in the 1500s. So what, what you think of as Creole food, before you get to the, the, the grand restaurants of New Orleans, you've got 300 years of development before Antoine's opens up. So you've got rice, beans, you know, chilies, cilantro, peppers, Spanish bringing over onions and garlic, and these things mix with the chilies, and you get your 
Trinity or Sofritos and everything else that's involved in these styles of cooking are developed for hundreds of years before the first, you know, Pompano and Papio or Oysters Rockefeller, all these things that we associate with these old Creole dishes, you know, everything from, but everything precedes that by hundreds of years before they get here. So for me, it was a simple, you know, I was trying to figure out, like, if you ask somebody, what do you think Cajun food is? And they might say, well, gumbo and jambalaya. I mean, that, that so far precedes any French exiles from Canada living in Louisiana. You know, that's, that's not where, how that happened. I mean, <laughs> they didn't bring gumbo from Canada. I mean, and <laughs> so, you know, and you could call these foods soul food, country food, southern food, I mean, you know, Creole food. I mean, they're all pretty much the same thing when you really think about it. And it's, you know, it's the, it's the change of these cultures over time. So, yes, you have the French people come down. And that's, you know, between the Haitians and the French exiles, that's the real French influence in Louisiana. It's not the, it's not the original settlers. It's, it's those exiles that move here. So you've got this mix of cultures, and it's still a mix. And it's really not that much difference. I mean, if you're, you know, people say the tomato is the difference between Cajun and Creole. And <laughs> sure, they use more tomatoes in New Orleans than over there. And there are minor differences, but they're really just dialects of the same language. You know, where there's more sausage because of the German and, you know, German settlements in two hours west of here, so you'll see a lot more sausage in the food. Or if you go in that part of Cajun, the sausage and rice, if you go start going down to, you know, Morgan City, you'll see a lot more seafood and a lot more you know, oysters and shrimp dishes. And then you've got the, you know, my mother's generation of cream of mushroom soup. That becomes a really big thing. If you look at all these old River Road cookbooks, Cream mushroom soup, cream mushroom soup, cream mushroom soup. And hey, look. It was big it. in the Midwest, too. I love, yeah, I love it. Don't get me wrong. It's, this stuff's amazing. It was at Alzina's. I don't know if anybody's had the joy of going to Alzina's in Galliano. Uh, but she does this casserole, and all of us chefs are sitting there like, oh, my God, this is the greatest thing ever. It's like crab meat and rice. And when she showed us the recipe, it's cream of mushroom soup. <laughs> <laughs> but, what hey, man, the, um, fantastic, though. I, the, we've also got, uh, finally on the panel, there's an under-the-radar guy that I think we're going to be hearing from in the years ahead named Emeril Lagasse, who, um, you know, if anyone is a descendant of Ella Brennan, who's not actually a Brennan, it's Emeril. Um, but, I, you know, when you moved to, Emeril is a native of, New England, who came here to cook at Commander's Palace, and I was actually looking through your first cookbook recently. It's one of the first books I read when I moved here trying to educate myself. And to kind of bring things full circle, we've talked about how this is a city that is, um, you know, uh, incredibly diverse on the plate, and it's just getting more so. And it gets more so when you either look backwards or you look forwards. Um, but I know, you know, a lot of people sort of came to New Orleans because of Emerald, and from the get-go, you presented it in your books and on television as a melting pot. You know, like you, what can you, I, I guess I'd like you to talk to a little bit about what did you find when you came here? You know, I know that you did a lot of traveling and Cajun country and all that sort of stuff. If you could recall a little bit about the diversity or the lack of it that you saw when you got here that really inspired you. Thank you. Of course. Um, <laughs> so, Right after the Cuisine Symposium in 1983 is when Eller and Dick uh, and Dottie um, brought me to New Orleans. And uh, the three of them, obviously, huge mentors, but particularly my friend Ella was my teacher. Um, you know, we would... Um, we would laugh and she would say, learn about the culture, learn about the history, learn about the people. And I would say, okay, here we go. So um, not being from Louisiana, not being from New Orleans, although I've been here now 37 years, um, that's exactly what I did was try to understand the people and the culture, and which made me understand the food. But in order to do that, you had to get out there. 
So you had to go see the farmer and you had to go fishing and, and, and be with the Vietnamese people that are really supplying most of the fish and, and shrimp these days in, in Louisiana and understand the culture, understand the people, and understand the food. And I think what I think what Ella really embraced to me. I mean, she didn't. She, I don't think she owned a pan, <laughs> as I said earlier in the, in the video. I really don't. But she had the most incredible, incredible palate that I've ever known. And um, she always embraced every day, not only hospitality but what I call deliciousness, because if not, there was no smile. And we all need a smile. And so for me, Brett, um, now 300 years uh, of tradition, what she embedded in me to understand and respect tradition, never disrespect that, and I never did re disrespect that. Today, chefs, they want to go left, they want to go right, but they got to understand tradition and they got to understand the culture, the people. And if you understand the culture and the people, you understand the food, no matter where you are. And that is why I'm here. And that's why I'm so touched with the Brennan family. I'm so glad that this is happening here, this symposium and a tribute to my friend, Ella Brennan. Uh, I think I'm correct that we have some time for some questions. Am I? Uh, I don't know if uh, it, it's impossible for us to see, um, but I know that there are some microphones traveling around, and if you wave hi, if anyone has a Come on, oh, there's one back there. Something tells me that's Pope. <laughs> yeah. This is for Chef Nina. Turn it on. This is for Chef Nina, who has done a damn good job in a, a short amount of time. It must have been daunting as all a get out to come here. Who approached whom and how did you get here? Um, I got a by the, the hotel group that we are at right now, Providence. And um, when we first got the phone call, we walked into the space and it was just bricks and dirt and wires hanging down. And something just spoke to me and something just said, this is, this is the one. Because we had seen tons of restaurants in different states um, being approached to do restaurants in Chicago, in Miami, in New York. LA, and as soon as I walked in, just something just said, this is the one for me, but it was not just finding the space, but it was just a complete package of being embraced by all my chef friends now that made me feel welcome and like I could you know, succeed here, which I think is very special and very unique and rare to the city because I don't think anywhere else, like I said, would say, you know, good for you. They would probably want to see me fail, but it's a different story here. People want to see you succeed, which I think is very special. Back here. You can yell. Start by yelling. <laughs> Listen, I had the honor of working in this city in the early 80s, and one of the things as a young you know, somebody looking for a career in hospitality and in food in particular was, I think back then we were all looking for what's that, what's that place in the United States that's a crucible of cooking, right? What, where, where could we go that, that it really has a sense of place? And back then, I think a lot of us were all trying to discover where, where is that place? Where do we learn you know, it's not imitation cuisine. We're trying to, can we can cook French, we can cook Italian, Okay, so now we figured out we can cook all that. Now what? You know, you know who are we? But one thing I've always uh, experienced here in New Orleans is, no matter what restaurant, whether it's Italian, French, 
any any kind of uh, ethnic restaurant, Cajun, you know, wh whatever it, it, it is. There's a DNA in every bite of food here in, from every good restaurateur. You know, there is, it's a common taste, and Ella used to call it the pow, right? <laughs> Where's the pow in, in this dish? It's a nice dish, but there's no pow, right? Um, so how would you define what that DNA is? You know, it just seems like you could eat the same thing here that you could eat in another city, but somehow there's a couple molecules of this in it. So how does that happen? Is it conscious? Do you really think about it when you put a dish out, or is it just something that is just because of who you're working with, your staff, the way you were trained and brought up? I know it's a broad question, but, but what's the DNA, the real, real what, DNA? I, you know, you reference Ella, and so I wonder if Emeril wants to take that. I, we're kind of short on time, but like, uh, you know, she, he talked about the POW. I've heard about this POW thing. Um, I've heard you say something similar. Um, the, uh... <laughs> See, what, it, what happened I... is it started with Ellery's pow, and then it moved to bam. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I hear exactly, Xavier, what you're saying is that there's this depth of flavors here in Louisiana and New Orleans that I, you, you can't describe to people. But it's like sort of, how do you describe Mardi Gras to people? And that's exactly when I, when you look at the food, it's exactly, there's so, so much depth because of history, ingredients, um, that makes this so unique. I wanna add one thing real quick to that. On these trips. <laughs> is your mic? My mic, am I on? It's on these trips that I've taken to Guadalupe, St. Lucia, Puerto Rico, you know, Uruguay, all, all these places that have this influence that then came up to New Orleans. Yeah. And this is why I went looking. It's just one of the big reasons. It's the, it's the flavor profile is where it came from. It didn't start here. It came from there. So like when I had Boudin and Guadalupe, and there's a lot of it there. It's different than ours, but it's the same salt and spice level that I thought oh. was so interesting. It's got depth, salt, spice. Same thing, the fried chicken in Puerto Rico, or just all these dishes that I've had on these travels, it has that. Yep, that you don't exactly. get when you go, say, uh, anywhere else, really. Yep. I mean, I can't think of another place in the world I've been where it's like, you know, I just, I went to, um, oh, what's that country, Scotland. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I went to Scotland and, you know, I love the food. I think haggis is amazing. The best things I've had, but it doesn't have the, like I said, it's rich, it's salty, it's spice, and you can find it in in the new world, there, which is the Creole world. There is a special lady out there also. Her name is Marcel Benvenu, and um, she taught me. She taught me um, about layers of flavor, and when you really think about it, the salt, this cayenne pepper, this bay leaf. And then where else do you go? But if you understand the layers, and this is what Marcel drilled in my head, was there are layers and layers of flavor that are built on something as simple as those seasoning. Yeah, like where you grew up, cook, where you grew up. Searing the meat, scraping the meat, deglazing, 100%. reducing. I mean, this is, it's, it's a method of layering that combines these old Creole traditions with some with some really good basic French techniques of, you know, you put those two together and you've got a really complex, involved food. I think we have time for I can't more. see, can you? I, sort of, <laughs> I, I, we got time for another question. If there is one out there, sir. This is more of a, an eco Hello? economic question. After the storm, a lot of your workforce was sent all over the country uh, with operations like Cafe Reconcile. Uh, how is your workforce in New Orleans today? Does everyone, do you have enough work staff? Do you have a shortage of employees? Or, or how, is, how are you affected? Is, has it come back? Mike will take this. I know we've, we've had some conversations about it. I'm sure there's a lot of people, oh, but I know. Thanks for telling me that one. Uh, uh, I mean, well, you and I talked about this last night. It's just, you know, and Chef Donald brought up a good point. He's like, man, just always be hiring because we're, we're facing that problem now where there's just, and I think that's a, 
is a big kind of shift right now to make kitchens uh, better, healthier for their staff because kitchens are can be brutal places. But I, and, and I believe that there are things we can do to make it uh, healthier for people, but you can't take away the hard work. Uh, to run a restaurant is hard work. I mean, it just is. And you have, to, you have to love it. You have to love being in there every day and, and, and really and inspiring people to do it with you because it is a lot of work and, and the economics of it make it very hard to pay people well unless you have a very, very busy restaurant, which I'm not quite there yet. Uh, I'm working on it. But, you know, and so I'm in a different stage than a lot of other people on this panel. So to see my side of it is I'm at that point where I'm still kind of trying to convince people to be starving artists. To, to, to learn from me and to do what I'm doing while I'm still paying back all of my build-outs for my restaurants and all the things that I can't really make a whole lot of profit on yet um, because I'm still pay, paying back banks all the time. Um, but that's my perspective, whereas I think everyone else is up here might have a slightly different one and probably a better one because they've been owning restaurants way longer than I have. So. I mean, one thing I wonder, too, is, is this kind of came up in a panel earlier today about how the challenge of the rising cost of living uh, impacts staffing because, you know, that seems to be true in just about any city that has a vibrant restaurant culture, certainly in the cities that we associate with vibrant restaurant cultures. It seems that the, right. the cost of living is rising faster than the, the wages, particularly in restaurants. I don't... Yeah, but I think there's something else we need to pay close attention to. I'm very happy to see folks from Delgado's culinary program in the audience today. <laughs> For decades, they've been helping to put local people into New Orleans restaurants. It's fabulous that people come here to study food. It's fabulous that they learn our food and infuse their own personality into our food. But ultimately, when we talk about the kind of dialogue between the kitchen at home and the kitchen at the restaurant, it's people who are born and bred of this place. Additionally, we can't lose sight of the fact that when Rudy Lombard wrote Creole Feast in 1978, Almost all of the cooks and restaurants in this city were black. A big part of what he was trying to say with that book is that a whole lot of the chefs leading those restaurants were also black. We don't see that to the same extent now, although the population of our city is still largely of African descent. And when we talk about staffing levels and the potential crisis in that, perhaps we should do as Booker Washington once said and cast our buckets where we are try to figure out how we can train and hire our people to work in our restaurants. Not that there's anything wrong with other people coming in, but ultimately, if we're talking about economic development here and culinary advancement here, that's a crucial component. We can't forget that. That's a good one. Dude. I think that's a good one to end on. Um, and please give it up for all of these folks.